This is the day that the Lord has made, and we ought to rejoice and to be glad in it. I was glad when they said unto me, Let us go into the house of the Lord. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endured to all generations. Let everything that hath breath Praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. We're so excited uh, to come into your homes and into your lives by way of the W3 Baptist Church here in the great city of Mobile, Alabama. We welcome you to worship with us and to praise God with us. And we welcome you to our 11 a.m. service. We pray that you have your Bibles, your electronic devices as we go to the Lord. Uh, go to the Word of God as we share with you uh, a special message today out of the book of Psalms. And so before we get into the Word of God, I hope that and pray that you are excited about this day that God has allowed you to see how God kept you as you slumbered and slept last night and touched you with his fingertip of love and allowed you to see a brand new day. If you're watching, if you're streaming, would you go ahead and hit the share button and share that on your personal pages so that others uh, may have an opportunity to worship with you and with us as well. We are uh, making a global impact for Jesus Christ and we're so excited about all the things that God is doing by way of the W3 Baptist Church. So if you have your Bibles, you have your electronic devices, if you found a still place in your home so that you can concentrate, so that you can focus, worship, and hear the Word of God, that is great. And God is great to be praised. So before we begin, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, we thank you because you've been so good to us. We thank you because you brought us from a mighty long ways. We thank you, O Lord, because we don't know where we'd be if it had not been for you. You've been holding our hands. You've been supporting us. You've been strengthening us. And you are the very reason why we live, move, and have our being. We thank you, O God, because you look beyond our faults and you saw and met every one of our needs. We thank you that you loved us so much that you sacrificed your only son, Jesus Christ, who sacrificed his life on the cross and you raised him from the dead early the third day morning with all power in his hand. We thank you, O Lord, for the blood of Jesus that still has power. And God, we plead the blood of Jesus right now that you would cover us, that you would protect us, that you would restore us, that you would heal us, uh, that you would forgive us, that you would bless us. We pray in the name of Jesus that that blood would cover our spouses and our families, our children, uh, our neighborhoods, our communities, our schools, our churches, and the world at large. God, we thank you uh, for giving us life, health, and strength and the use and activities of our limbs. We remember those who are sick, those that are in prison, those that are homeless. And, oh God, we pray that your spirit would be with them and encourage them in their own trials and tribulations. We know that you are a strong God, that you are a mighty God, that you are a powerful God. We know that you are an almighty God. You are an all strong God and you are an all powerful God and we bless your name. We wouldn't serve another God because there's no God like you, Jehovah, and we bless your holy name. Now we pray that you would stir up the gift that is within us. We pray that your spirit would move from heart to heart. We pray that your spirit would move from house to house. And from person to person as we share your word uh, with the world on today. We pray that you open our hearts, our minds, and our understanding that we may hear clearly from you. Remove all distractions, all hindrances, all disturbances that will cause an interference uh, in our relationship and hearing from you. Bless now in our time of sharing. In this word, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Listen, I always feel better after prayer. 
prayer changes things. And when prayer doesn't change things, it does change you. Amen. And you ought to feel better after you pray. And I want to encourage you uh, to always talk to your father. Always pray to God. He's close to you. He hears your prayers, your supplications, and your petitions. And God is ready, willing, and able uh, to supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory. Talk to your father. Amen. And so here we are in the book of Psalm, uh, Psalm 37, Psalm 37, uh, verse number 25, Psalm 37, verse number 25. And when you found it, uh, we pray that you would focus your attention on these few words that was spoken by King David, Psalm 37, verse number 25. Psalm 37, verse number 25. And real quickly, yes, the Psalms have stanzas, but they also have verses. And within this stanza is this verse, uh, Psalm 37, verse number 25. And it reads, I have been young and now am old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. I've been young, and now I'm old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor God's seed begging bread. I want to preach from this thought, seven things God has never seen. Seven things God has has never seen. I want the subject to soak in for just a moment. Seven things God has never seen. In an illustration by Dr. Tony Evans, he states that the sun, the S-U-N, is a light source 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. He states that all year long, all decade long, all century long, the sun keeps on shining. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, all year long, all decade long, all century long, the sun keeps on shining. The problem, however, is that the earth gets dark. How can there be all that light and the earth still gets dark? How can the earth get dark when the sun is a light source 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year? How can the earth get dark when the sun is shining all year long, all decade long, and all century long, how does the earth get dark? It's because the earth turns. The earth gets dark because the earth is spinning on its axis. Therefore, the side that faces the sun gets light, and the side that is facing away does not. Tony Evans suggests in this illustration that if there is darkness in your life, it's not because the father of lights is turning, it's because you are turning. God is the ultimate light source shining 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. All year long, all decade long, all century long, God's light is constantly shining. But perhaps there are some dark times in our lives, not because God is not shining, but because we're spinning on our own axis. And perhaps that side of our life has turned away from the light of God. It's because we are turning and not because God is turning. Here it is, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters. 
David is in a place in his life right now where he is done spinning. He had spinned ever since he was young, as a young adult, as a young man, as a young husband, as a young father. He was spinning. But now he's reached a place in his life where he's done spinning. He has seen the light. He has found his spot and place in God. And he is fixed on the Lord and he will not rotate or spin anymore. And I want to encourage somebody early in this illustration that God is not the one that's spinning. That if you want to stay in the light path of God, then you need to keep your face towards God. He's always shining bright in our lives. Don't let the turmoil, the trials, and the tribulations of your life cause you to spin so much that you are out of the light source of God. Matter of fact, the Bible says that God's word is a light unto our, a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our pathway. God is the light and he is shining bright in our lives if we stop spinning so much and focus ourselves on the Lord. And here is David when he writes Psalm 37 around verse number 25. He says, I'm done spinning. He said, and when I stop spinning on my own life's personal issues, I discovered something. Isn't it amazing? When you slow down in life and concentrate on the things that are important, God being number one, you will realize some things that you had not realized realized before. Let me say it again. When you stop being so busy being busy and focus on the things that are important, God will reveal unto you some things that you had never known or experienced before. Read where I said it one more time, Pastor Brown. Somebody was fussing at the kids. Let me try it again. I said, when you stop being so busy, being busy, and focus on what matters the most, God being number one, he will show you some things that you have never seen before and help you understand things you never understood before. Here is David in Psalms 37. He said, I slowed down. I stopped spinning. I stopped being so busy. I concentrated on the Father of lights. And here is what David has discovered. David said, I used to be young. But now I have grown old. And from my transition of being young to now growing old, I've come to a deductive reasoning and a conclusion. I have a hypothesis. I have triangulated the data. And I've come to the conclusion that I have not seen the righteous forsaken. David said, wait a minute. Let me think about this. God called me when I was 10, 11, or 12 years old to be the king while I was keeping sheep on the backside of a mountain for my father Jesse. I was finally invited to the king's house only to play the harp and music for Saul. Eventually God allowed me to become captain of the army and fight for Saul and then God allowed me to become king of two tribes. Then God finally allowed me to become king of all twelve tribes. I caught all kinds of hell and confusion. I used to be young I used to run. I used to fight. I used to go back and forth. David said, but now that I'm older, I'm too old to be fighting and acting foolish and clowning. David said, I thought about something now that I sat down. You know what I just thought about? I've been young and now I'm old, but I'm not seeing the righteous forsaken. David actually is speaking not of all of God's creation. He's really speaking for himself. Psalm 37 verse 25 says, I, which is a personal pronoun, have been young and now I am old. Look at the second clause of that verse. He says, yet have I 
not seen the righteous forsaken. David says, I have served as a king. I have served tens of thousands of people that claim that they love God. And even as their king, I have never seen the righteous forsaken. I've seen a whole lot of folk that say they love God. And one thing I cannot say is that God had forsaken them. Even in my own trials and tribulations, even when it looked like God had abandoned me, God did not forsake me. And not only have I not seen the righteous forsaken, but I have not seen his seed beg for bread. He's saying God has been so good that God has provided. He has met all of our needs. And even as a king serving tens and thousands of people, I've never seen God's seed, God's children, God's offspring, those that love God. I've never seen them begging for bread because the Lord is our shepherd and we shall not lack any good things. His seed don't have to beg for bread because God supplies all of our needs. Here's David. He's saying, I've, I've not seen this before. And it made me think about something because I used to be young and I'm getting older. I'm not old. I used to be young. I'm not young anymore. I'm, I'm progressing and leaning towards older. I'm getting older. But in my older phase, I've come to the reasoning that there are some things I believe God has never seen. I believe, number one, God has never seen a way he could not make it. Oh, have mercy. I'm about to preach this till I feel better. I said, God has never seen a way he could not make. You don't believe me? Well, turn your Bibles to Exodus chapter number 14. There you will find about 2.1 million children of Israel whom God has allowed to be emancipated under the ruling of a Pharaoh in Egypt. As Moses is leading them through the long path of the wilderness, God touches the heart or the spirit of Pharaoh to gather his army, his chariots, his horses with their swords, their blades, and their shields to chase after the children of Israel and as they gathered near them the Bible says God put a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night to cause a buffer between the army of Pharaoh and the last person in line with the children of Israel. They get to the Red Sea and almost lose their mind because there's a mountain on the left side there's a mountain on the right side there's an angry mob of an army behind them and and there's a Red Sea that's uncrossable in front of them. And perhaps I'm preaching to somebody on this Sunday morning that feels like I'm doing what God has told me to do. God promised that he would emancipate me and free me. And as I'm taking this long journey with God, I have found myself in a caged like situation. I got a mountain on one side. I got a mountain on the other side. I got the enemy behind me and a Red Sea in front of me. I don't know who I'm preaching to, but I've been in a situation like that. Well, it felt like there was no way out. Can I tell you something? Can I bust your little bubble real quick? With man, there may not be no way out, but with God, all things are possible. The Bible says that when Moses prayed unto God, God told Moses, boy, use what's in your hand. Moses said, all I have is this little stick. He said, stretch it out over the Red Sea. The Bible says that when Moses obeyed God and stretched out his rod or stick or staff over the Red Sea, that it opened up on both sides. And not only did it open up and stand up on its left and its right, but God caused the base and the ground of the Red Sea to be dried up. And the children of Israel marched across the Red Sea on dry ground to the other side. Here is why. Because God has never seen a way he cannot make. And the same God that opened up a Red Sea for Moses and the children of Israel is the same God that opened up and make a 
way for you. I wish you look at somebody in your house and say, God is a way maker. He's a miracle worker. He's a promise keeper. He's a light in the darkness. My God, he's an awesome God. I said, God has never seen a way that he could not make. Maybe you didn't believe that, but let's try this one. There is in Joshua chapter number three, the successor of Moses. Joshua was told by God that as I was with Moses, so shall I always be with you. And here it is on that confirmation, that affirmation. Joshua is now the new leader of the children of Israel. Let me just stop here again and help somebody because you used to follow somebody that loved God. Perhaps it was your mother, your father, your grandma, or somebody that God has called home to glory. You look to them, your faith, your strength resided in them. Your hope was in them. They inspired you and encouraged you, but God has called them on to glory. Can I just help you real quick? The same God that was with your mother, the same God that was with your big mama, the same God that allowed someone to inspire you and encourage you is you is the same God that's going to be with you right now. As God was with Moses, so he was with Joshua. He told Joshua, I want you to head down to a city called Jericho. On their way to Jericho, they came across a body of water called the Jordan River. It's during flood season. They cannot tiptoe through this river. They can't cross this river. The river is high. It has high tides right now. It's flooded right now. And the people look to Joshua what are we going to do? Joshua said, I tell you what, I want you to take the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant, that built instrument where God resides and have a seat on it, where God sits to show his presence and power with the children of Israel. He said, I want you to take a man from every tribe of the children of Israel, 12 men, take the Ark of the Covenant before you, and you all march into the Jordan River. Can you imagine? They take the Ark of the Covenant. They begin to roll their pants legs up. And those 12 men begin to step in the Jordan River. And the Bible said that when they put their foot in the river, that the Jordan River stood up on both sides. Here's why. Because Joshua said, if you put God first, if you seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these other things shall be added unto you. God will make away if you put God first. Preach Pastor Brown. I think I will. Say it again. Rewind one more time. I said God will make a way if you put God first. God has never seen a way he could not make. I didn't mean to leave it that long. I got six more things to tell y'all. I hope you I hope you brought your patience with you. Number two. Number two. God has never seen a disease he could not eat. I want to say before I prove it to you with these verses that I don't care what your doctor has told you. I don't care what your physician has said. I don't care about those that are practicing medicine on you has told you what your diagnosis and your prognosis is. I don't care what they have told you. You go see the doctor. You take the medicine. You do the treatment. But all of your trust ought not be in your doctor. You ought to put some trust in God. God has never seen a disease he could not heal. Prove it, Pastor Brown. I think I will. In Mark chapter number 5, verses 25 through 34, there's a woman. This woman has gone to every physician. She has gone to her OBGYN. She has gone down to the women's health care and discovered that there's nothing they can do. This woman has been bleeding for 12 long years. She's lost weight. She's gotten sick because of the loss of blood consistently flowing out of her body. There's nothing no one can do. This woman started off wealthy and spent everything that she had. And the Bible says that she didn't get any better 
right? She got worse. This woman got sicker. She lost more of her health. And the text goes on to say that Jesus is taking a Paseo Grande to the house of a man by the name of Jairus who come to beseech Jesus because he has a 12-year-old daughter at home that's sick and getting ready to die. Jesus says, Jairus, don't be afraid. I'm on the way. And while Jesus is walking with his disciples and Jairus, there's a throng of people surrounding Jesus and walking with him. They were walking with him, but they were not walking with him. They were with him, but they were not with him. They were bumping into him, but they wasn't touching him. And the Bible says that this woman who had an issue of blood for 12 years got down on her hands and her knees and she made her way through the press and crawled around people and touched the dragging threads of Jesus' garment. And the Bible says as soon as she touched him, the fountain of her blood was dried up and that woman was made whole. I'm coming to tell somebody that God has never seen a disease that he cannot heal. Have you touched the hem of his garment? Come here, old Baptist preacher. There's more medicine in the hem of his garment than all pharmacies across the land. I don't care how many drugs they make, how many opioids they make, how many injections they put in your vein. Can't nobody heal you like Jesus when the doctors have failed. When the physicians have ran out of education, when the pharmacies have not produced the medicine, I know a bomb in Gilead. I know a healer that's given a healing to the sick. I know somebody that you can call on in the midnight hour. There is no sickness, no disease that God cannot heal. I got one more. I got one more testimony. In Luke chapter number 13, verses 10 through 13, there's another woman. She has been with an infirmity for 18 years. She's been bent over. She's not able to stand up straight. She has what is similar to a spinal cord disease. She has a bone disease. Her body has not developed where she can stand erect like we can. She's bent over. All she sees is the ground. Every time she tries to lift up, it feels like she's going to break vertebrae in her spine. She's hurting, she's in pain, but she ran into Jesus. And the Bible says after 18 years of being bent over, Jesus touched that woman and lifted her up and put some pimp in her step. I don't know about you and how long you've been with your sickness, but I can tell you this. If you let Jesus touch it, if you let God lay his hands on it, God has never seen a disease that he could not heal. Lord have mercy. Would you tell somebody that? Would you type that? Would you send a text message to somebody that you know is sick in your body and tell them God has never seen a sickness that he could not heal. I hope we're doing all right because I got five more things to tell you. Number three, God has never seen a soul that wanted to be saved that he could not say. I didn't even work this hard at 7.30. I'm sweating here. Yeah. At 11 o'clock, y'all got me working hard. God has never seen a soul that wanted to be saved that he could not say. Yeah. Prove it, Pastor Brown. I think I will. Right. If you remember in Jonah chapter 1 and 2, there was a preacher that God uh, called to go to Nineveh to cry against that great city because Jonah had some personal issues with, with Nineveh. He decided to go to Tarshish. He paid the fares thereof, got on a boat, and went in the opposite direction. He was supposed to be going northeast. This boy got on the boat and headed southwest. He was headed in the total opposite direction, went down to the bottom of the boat and fell asleep. But, but God just won't let his preachers get on a boat in opposition and disobedience. God won't let a child of God run from their assignment.
assignment and purpose in life. So the Bible says God sent the storm and shook up the boat and woke up Jonah. Jonah went top deck and consulted with the captains of the boat. They began to throw their cargo overboard. They began to throw their personal items overboard. They were rowing hard trying to survive in this storm. Jonah finally got honest and said, it's not y'all, it's me. If you take me up and throw me over, the storm would cease. They tried to row even harder, but it didn't get any better. It got worse. They took Jonah up. They threw him overboard, and the Bible said God prepared a great fish that swallowed Jonah whole and took him to the bottom of the sea floor, and there Jonah was in the mouth or the belly of a whale at the bottom of the sea floor. Now listen, sometimes there are some situations that only God can get you out of. Who can swim down to the bottom of the sea floor, look a whale in the face, and speak its language, and ask that whale to cough up what's in its belly? I ain't never seen it before. I've seen zoologists, I've seen scuba divers film whales in their natural habitat, but I don't know not now nobody that knows how to speak whale language. I don't know anyone that can make the whale do exactly what the whale wants to do. You remember the whale that they tried to train and that whale turned on them. We got to be careful trying to play like we are God. Here is Jonah in a situation that only God can get him out of. And the Bible says that after three days and three nights, Jonah came to himself. He said, I can't save me. I can't save myself, but I know somebody that can. And the Bible says that boy prayed from the belly of the whale at the bottom of the sea floor with the breeze passing all over him. He couldn't open his mouth. He couldn't speak words, but he prayed out of the abundance of his heart and because God is not hard of hearing. He heard Jonah's prayer. Y'all miss y'all shout. He's under the water. He's in the belly of a whale at the bottom resting on the sea floor. He does not open his mouth but he prays from his heart and the Bible said God heard his prayer. If God can hear Jonah under the water in the belly of a whale at the bottom of the sea floor, then surely God can hear your prayers. And I don't know what you need to be saved from, but wherever you are, if God got to reach way down, he can pick you up. There's never been a soul that wanted to be saved that God could not save. Pastor, I don't believe in that fish story. Okay. All right, I get it. That's, that's a fairy tale. Okay, didn't no whale swallow no whole man. Okay, well, let's try this. Matthew 14 and 30. Maybe you don't believe in the Old Testament. Let me hit you with this New Testament story. The Bible says that Jesus had just fed 5,000 men with two fish and five barley loaves. Would have been 10 to 12,000 if you include the women and the children. He sends his disciples away with 12 basketfuls of leftover fish and bread. He gives the benediction to all of these people. He goes on the mountain to pray. The sun begins to set and begins to become sundown, sunset. He walks off the mountain. When he walks off the mountain, he walks on the land. He walks on the land. He walks on the beach. He walks on the beach. He walks on the pebbles. Walks on the pebbles. Walks on the sand. And when the sand runs out, Jesus walks on the water. Because God is able to walk on all things. He's walking out on the water. The Bible says the fourth watch of the night, which means it was between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. in the morning. And here are the disciples stuck in the middle of the sea in the midst of a storm. And watch what Jesus says to them. Do not be afraid. It's me. It's Peter that says, Lord, well, if it's you, then let me come out on the water with you. And Peter Peter gets out of the boat and walks towards Jesus on the water. You missed your shout. That when Jesus tells you you can do it, you can do it. That if God be for you, he's more than everything against you. That you can do all things through Christ that gives you strength. He walks on the water. He walks towards Jesus. 
But the Bible goes on to say, in all of his amazement, he began to look around at his situation and his circumstance. And seeing that everything is boisterous, he began to take his focus off of Jesus and focus on his situation. And he begins to sink and drown. And Peter does something that blesses my life. I hope it blesses yours as well. Peter says the shortest prayer in the Bible. He says, Lord, save me. He does not get all Baptist. He does not pretend to be one of those old Baptist deacons that say, Lord, I'm coming to you as humbly as I know how. With my head between the locks of my shoulder and me bent and bow. Now, now, now they didn't say all of that. He said, Lord, save me. Here is why. Because you ain't got time to be political. You ain't got time to be sedated. You ain't got time to be all dignified when you drowning in life situations. There's somebody that I'm preaching to right now that can testify that when I was in my trials and tribulations, I didn't have time to have no cute prayers. I said, Lord, have mercy. Lord, save me. Lord, help me. Those are the realest prayers you ever prayed. And then God show up. Then God help you. Then God come to the rescue. Then God stretch out a hand and lift you out of your situations. And the same God that did it for Peter is the same God that'll do it for you. God has never seen a soul that wanted to be saved that he could not save. Number four. God has never seen a problem he could not solve. All right. Ooh, Lord, have mercy. All right. I'm, I'm All feeling right. good here. I'm sorry. Right. Y'all got me working hard. God right. has never seen a problem he could not solve. Okay. Oh, that was a problem in Exodus 16 and 17. Here's the problem. Snickers figured it out. The Snickers commercial used to say, you're not yourself when you're hungry. All right. Because we, they must have had black folk in mind. Because when we get hungry, we get impatient. We get intolerant. We, we ain't got time. We, we hungry. We got one thing on our mind, food. And whatever is in between us and food uh, is going to eventually get devoured. You, 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 you turn to a different person when you're hungry. Here's the children of Israel. There's over two million of them. They just came across the Red Sea. Exodus 15, they sang songs of praise, thanking God for his deliverance of the children of Israel and the enemies being swallowed up in the Red Sea to see no more. After they're finished worshiping, singing, and praising God with timbrels, tambourines, as the Bible says, now they hungry. They have no bread. We've done all this worship and we ain't got no food to eat. I gave them some credit. Because we ought not be so hungry if we had not worshipped. Yeah. Oh, y'all yeah. oh, got quiet on me right there. When you worship God and you praise God, it ought to make you hungry. Oh, man, those grits taste better after worship. Oh, Lord, that meat, that bologna sandwich tastes better after worship. Here it is. In Exodus 16 and 17, they have no bread. Moses goes to God. He says, God, these folk are complaining. They have no food. You brought them all the way across the Red Sea, out of the wilderness, out of under Pharaoh. They have no food to eat. God said, stand back and stand by. All right, all right. He goes in the heaven's kitchen. He turns the stove on. He puts on his apron. He gets his dough. He gets his wheat. He gets his salt and his sugar. He needs it all together. He places it in the oven. Checks his own watch because he's an on time God. He opens up the stove. Takes out the pan with the bread on it. Opens up the large window of heaven and sprinkles out fresh bread. Now from heaven and fed 2.1 million hungry Israelites. Now I'm trying to tell y'all there was some black folk amongst those children of Israel and you know when we get hungry us like to eat. We love an all you can eat buffet and they've gotten rid of all you can eat buffets. A lot of them have gone out of business because of us. We put them out of business because we show up and we eat everything 
thing that they put out faster than they can cook it. And some of y'all need to repent because you put chicken wings and all kind of stuff in your purse on your way out of the all-you-can-eat buffet. And here is God turning a wilderness into an all-you-can-eat buffet. And he fed the children of Israel all of that bread from heaven. Here's why. Because God has never seen a problem that he could not solve. The same folk got thirsty. God tells Moses, I want you to speak to the rock. He spoke to the rock and water came out of the rock. And all of those children of Israel drank sweet water from the rock. Here's why. Because God has never seen a problem that he could not solve. If you are hungry for the living bread, God can quench or, or feed your hunger. If you are thirsty for the fountain of Jesus, God can quench your thirst. Here it is in 2 Kings chapter 2 verses 19 through 22. There's a prophet by the name of Elisha. He's approached by the elders of the city in Jericho. Listen, Elisha. Elijah is gone. You are the new prophet in charge. We have all of this beautiful land. This is a beautiful city. But the water is bad. The water is bad. The water feeds the grounds. The grounds are bad. The grounds grow the crop and vegetation. They are bad. The animals uh, graze upon the, the vegetation and the ground. The animals are sickly. And if we can't consume the vegetation and the animals, uh, we will be sick and die as well. Elisha, this is a major economical uh, disaster. Elisha, you are the prophet uh, and you need to do something about this food and drug administration. Elisha, you are in charge. And this is an agricultural shift and change that could end our livelihood. Elijah said, let me pray about this thing. And God told Elijah to get a new jar, a new vessel and put some salt in it and stand at the mouth or the springs of the water. And he said, from this day forward these waters shall be healed. He cast the salt into the spring of the waters and the Bible says that those waters were healed and the land was healed and the vegetation was healed and the livestock was healed and the people were healed. Here's why. Because God has never seen a problem that he could not solve. If God can do it for Moses and the children of Israel, if God can do it for Elisha and the city of Jericho, then God can do it for you. There is no problem God cannot solve. Number five. God has never seen a door that he could not open. Maybe I'm preaching to somebody that said, I need the Lord to make a way. I need the Lord to open a door for me. I need the Lord to do something for me that can't nobody else do. I'm here to tell you, God has never seen a door he could not open. In John 10, 9, Jesus said it profoundly, I am the door. Maybe the way you need made is found in Jesus. Maybe he's the door that you need to be knocking on. Maybe you just need to go to Jesus and let Jesus open the door for you. He says if anyone enters in by me, he or she shall be saved. Jesus said, I am the door. Maybe the blessing you're looking for is not a new job. It's not a new car. It's not a new bag. It's not a new boo. You looking for Jesus. You trying to fulfill a void in your life that only Jesus can fulfill. And if you go to Jesus and say, Jesus, I know you are the door. Here is the prize. Here it is. The price is right that you will find everything you need behind the door of Jesus. If you need joy, it's behind that door. If you need peace, it's behind that door. If you need rest, it's behind that door. If if you need a blessing, it's behind that door. You don't have to go out into the world knocking on the world doors. No, just go to Jesus. And everything you need, Jesus has it behind the door. 
As a matter of fact, in Revelations chapter 3, verse number 8, as John records his experience as he is uh, uh, cap captured in a vision and being escorted through heaven, he heard Jesus say, right unto the seven churches of Asia. And here Jesus says in Revelations 3, verse number 8, to the church at Philadelphia. He says unto them, I have set before you an open door. Yeah. I love y'all so much, is what he says, that I have set before you an open door. Watch what he says, that no man can shut. All right. All right. In other words, Jesus is saying, when I open a door for you, can't nobody else do nothing about it. You don't have to worry about nobody coming behind me trying to shut the door of your blessings and your peace. No, he says, I've never seen a door that I could not open. I don't want to hold you too much longer. Number six, the Bible oh, number six says, God has never seen a storm that he could not calm. God has never seen a storm that he could not calm. I, I, I feel good preaching this for myself. I'm a living witness. God has never seen a storm oh, yeah. that he could not come. I won't keep you long here. Uh, I, I, I'm going to cut across the field here. But in Mark chapter number 4, verse number 36, here they are again. The disciples are in a boat with Jesus. Yeah. He's with them this time. First time he wasn't with them. He's with them on the boat. And the Bible says a storm breaks out on the sea. And the disciples become confounded and confused and worried because the storm is causing the boat to rock and reel. They become so afraid that the Bible says they go down to the hull of the ship and they found Jesus sleeping on the boat in the midst of the storm. And out of their urgency, they shake Jesus to wake him up. Now, I'm a little backward here. Maybe I'm too spiritual. Maybe I'm just being too holy. Maybe I'm not connecting with the humanity of the text. But my mind tells me that as long as Jesus is on the boat, whether he's awake or asleep, i got to be good. Y'all didn't catch that, so we'll try again. Jesus is on the boat. Jesus is with the disciples. All of them are on the same boat. And all of them are in the same storm. If Jesus is asleep on the boat with the disciples in the same storm, why are they worried? Why are they not asleep as well? The storm first has to kill Jesus before it kills the disciples. And I've never seen a storm that took my Jesus out. If Jesus ain't worried about the storm, why are you worried about the storm? If Jesus is sleeping in the midnight hour, why are you up walking the floors? In the midnight hour, the same God that could calm the storm is with them in the midst of the storm. And the Bible says they want Jesus up. Watch what he says. He says, oh, ye a little faith. Man, I thought y'all was going to get through this. But I thought y'all had been blessed by the fish and the loaves. I thought y'all were going to make it. I thought y'all knew who I was. Y'all still don't know who I am because you don't have a, a lot of faith. Had you had faith, uh, you would have sat down, crossed your legs, uh, and played tic-tac-toe with one another. Had you had faith, uh, you would have sat down and laughed uh, and talked about when the storm is over. But because you don't have faith, uh, watch what Jesus does. Uh, he gets out of the bed. He wipes the sleep out of his eyes. Uh, he walks up top deck. Uh, he tells uh, the wind to be quiet uh, and tells the ways to be still. Uh, do not miss the order of God's rebuking of the storm. He doesn't rebuke the waves first and then rebuke the wind. No, he tells the wind to behave and the waves to be still. Here's why. Because we're so focused on the waves that are beating upon our boat that we think it's the waves that's causing all kinds of confusion in our lives. But what you need to understand is that it's not the waves that's really bothering you. It's the wind that's upsetting the waves and the waves are upsetting you. 
now. God is not into dealing with the symptoms of your problem. God is not into dealing with the side effects of your problem. No, God is into dealing with the root cause of your problem. And Jesus said, when set up and ways be sealed, because God had never seen a storm that he could not come. I like the disciples' position on this because the disciples let Jesus do all the talking. And when you are in a storm, it's best to let Jesus do all the talking. Let the Lord fight your battle. Let your peace be sealed. Stand seal and see the salvation of the Lord. God has never seen a storm that he could not come. I need to let you go here. Last one, number seven. God has never seen a tear that he could not wipe away. God has never seen a tear that he could not wipe away. In Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 39, there is a woman. The Bible says in Luke chapter number 7, verse 36, that she is a sinner woman. Now don't judge her because we don't know what her sins were. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Don't prejudge her. Listen to her story. The text says that she's a sinner woman and she's at a sinner's home. She's at a Pharisee's house. They declared to be righteous, but they were righteously against Jesus. They thought they abided by the letter of the law, but they denounced Jesus as the Son of God. Here she is, a sinner woman, at a house owned by someone who does not really acknowledge Jesus as Savior. And when she sees Jesus, the Bible says she couldn't stop crying. She's so close to the Savior that she began to weep uncontrollably. And when she's weeping uncontrollably behind Jesus, she interrupts the order of worship, walks over to Jesus, and begins to wipe or wash Jesus' feet with her tears. She wiped his feet with her hands. She kissed his feet with her lips. She anointed his feet with her hands with the oil from her alabaster box. Dr. Frank Ray said, to better help us understand this story, that women of that day would keep these vessels, these jars, these tear jars. And whenever they would cry, a mourning cry, a sorrowful cry, they would put the jar under their eyes and collect the tears. They would put their, those jars on shelves and they would save them for days of jubilee, for days of restoration, for days of joy. And when the day of joy came, they would take those tear jars and pour the tears out to signify that I'm no longer sorrowful over this thing I've been crying about. This this woman is believed to have been carrying her tear jar with her. And while she sees Jesus, she begins to weep. She pulls out her tear jar and begins to collect her tears. But something happens in the psyche of this woman's mind. She said, now wait a minute. I'm sitting here crying and I am in proximity of the one that can wipe my tears away. She said, I'm not going to keep crying about this. Uh, she takes her tear jar in one hand, her alabaster box in the other hand and she walks over to Jesus. She gets down on her knees. She doesn't tell the disciples, excuse me, because whenever you're trying to get to Jesus, you're not trying to be dignified. You need what you need. She got down there where Jesus was, got on her knees, opened up her tear jar and poured her tears on the feet of Jesus, signifying that I have met my Savior, and I don't have to cry about this no more, because He has the power to take all of my tears away, and I don't know what you've been crying about, but can I ask you to take your tears to Jesus? I don't know what's frustrating you, that's causing you to cry in the midnight hour, but can you take your tears to Jesus? Because if you go before the Lord, God will Wipe your tears away. Here it is. I'm 
done. Revelation 21 and 4 says that God has prepared for us a new place. He's prepared for us a new place. Uh, a new Jerusalem, if you will. That's descending from heaven above. He's prepared for us a new holy place. And in that place, in Revelation 21 and 4, it says, God has a big handkerchief. And he's going to wipe all tears from our eyes. All the things that we've been crying about, God is going to wipe our tears away. Because God has never seen a tear that he could not wipe away. Well, I need to let y'all go here, but I, I need to remind you that David starts this psalm in the hearing of his readers by saying this, fret not thyself because of evildoers. Neither be thou envious of the workers of iniquity. Watch what he says, verse number two, for they shall soon be cut down yeah. like the green grass. Yeah. They shall wither as the green herb. That's verse number one. But when you fast forward to verse number 40, David closes this psalm as a comfort to his readers by saying, and the Lord shall help them. The Lord shall deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them because they trust in him. God's going to deliver them you at the end of the psalm and David says don't even worry about your enemies at the beginning of the psalm he starts off the beginning of the psalm don't you worry about your enemies God's going to take care of them at the end of the psalm David says God is going to help you and deliver you from the wicked God is going to save you because you put your trust in him he starts off strong he ends strong and perhaps some of you are saying well I can relate to that I start off good and I know God got me in the end but the problem with you spinning on the axis of life is sometimes you find yourself in the darkness between verse number 1 and verse number 40 I know I've been there before I started off strong believing in God and I can shout that God brought me through, but in the middle of that storm, as the axis of my life was rotating, I found myself in a dark situation. I had turned away from the Father of lights, and David writes Psalm 37, 25, and he says, listen, when you get into the middle of that thing, don't you worry about it. When your enemies are raising up against you, don't you worry about it. When they come against you, you to attack you. Don't you worry about it. God's going to get you through it. And here is the word of encouragement. I have been young. See, sometimes the world needs to hear the testimony of some old saints that can tell these young folk, listen, I've been where you are. I've had my good days and my bad days. I've had my hills to climb. Come on, Holy Ghost. I feel my help in the house. But David said, listen, when you get in the middle of that thing, I want you to remember that I used to be young and now I am old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed beg for bread. The same God you start with is the same God you go finish with. And I don't care what happens in between. You just remember that if God be for you, he's more than the world against you. That if God is on your side, you're going to make it and you're going to be alright. I need to let y'all go so you can get you some brunch. But if God be for you and Jesus behind you and the Holy Ghost in you and goodness on one side and mercy on the other side, then you all you're gonna make it. You gotta pat yourself on the back one time and say, Child of God, I'm gonna make it. I'm gonna get through it. I've been young and now I'm old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken. The receive that for me. God has never seen a way that He could not make it, He's never seen a disease that He could not heal. He's never seen a soul that wanted to be saved that he could not save. He's never seen a problem he could not solve. He's never seen a door he could not open. He's never seen a storm that he could not calm. God 
God has never seen a tear that he could not wipe away. Don't fret yourself because of evildoers. Neither be thou envious of the workers of iniquity, for they soon shall be cut down like the green grass. They shall wither as the green herb. And God will help you. God will deliver you. God will save you because you trust in him. But in the meantime, in the process of God delivering you, you just remember in the middle of your own song, you have been young. And now you're older. Yet have you never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed beg for bread. Hallelujah. God bless you. I pray. That this message has encouraged, inspired, empowered somebody. Seven things God has never seen. And listen, my brothers and sisters, I want to encourage and appeal uh, to those of you, perhaps, that are watching that have not given your life to Christ. That this is an opportune time for you to open your heart to Jesus Christ right now. You can have the love of God. You can have the presence of God in your life. He's your father by creation. But he wants to be your father through the Christ-like relationship that he has established. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so we here at the W3 Baptist Church want to extend an invitation to Christian discipleship. We want you to have that relationship with Christ. God wants you to have that relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you're watching, if you're streaming, wherever you are, you can come to Jesus just as you are. Weary, wounded, and sad, you will find in him a resting place. God will make you glad. You're saying, well, preacher, pastor, what do I say? I haven't prayed to God on this wise before. I haven't talked to God about my soul salvation. What do I say? You can simply say the prayer that Peter prayed. Lord, save me. God judges the content and the character of your heart. He knows your sincerity. All you have to do is say, Lord, save me. And he knows exactly what you stand in the need of. And whatever that is, the Lord will save you. Salvation number one. And it can only be found through Jesus Christ. But if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That's what all the preaching is for. It's the preaching, number one, is designed to draw somebody to Jesus. Don't waste this moment. Don't waste this opportunity. Tomorrow is not promised. You have right now. You have right now. Yesterday is history. Tomorrow is a mystery. But today is a gift. That's why it's called the present. You have a present today. You have a gift today. You have the blessing of life today. Tomorrow's a mystery. We don't know if it's coming or not. We don't know if we're going to see it or not. Yesterday is history. It's gone. You can't relive it. But you can seize the moment now. Give your life to Jesus Christ while the blood is running warm in your veins. As you are praying, we're praying with you and for you. And perhaps you're watching or streaming. You're saying, listen, I don't need to hear another sermon. I don't need to watch another service. I want to join the W3 Baptist Church. The Spirit of Christ is leading me to join this church. We'd love to have you as a sister or brother in Christ. We have a team. We actually have a deacon and wife that's assigned to minister to those who are at distance from the city of Mobile and the W3 Baptist Church. And so if you want to join, we'd love to have you just send us a message. Uh, go to our website at the W3Church.com. Hit us up on our social media sites. Let us know that you want to join the W3 Baptist Church. We'd love to have you. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. For those that gave their life to Christ, God bless you. For those who are considering joining the W3 Baptist Church, God bless you. Now is a time for giving. It's our tithes and our offerings. God loves a cheerful giver, and you can't beat God's giving no matter how hard you try. And so we want to give you an opportunity to give, and there are several ways that you can give.
to the W3 Baptist Church for you old school check writers. Amen. You can write a check made payable to the W3 Church. Amen. You can also give electronically um, and you can utilize our cash app and PayPal methodologies. Uh, so if you have cash app, just look for us, our logo, uh, the W3 Church. Look for the logo, the W3 Church logo. Or you can go to PayPal, uh, the W3 Church, and give uh, that way as well. It doesn't matter how you give, but it does matter that you give. Knowing that you cannot be God's giving, no matter how hard you try. The more God gives... Uh, the more you give, the more God gives to you. Just keep on giving because it's really true. You can't be God's given no matter how hard you try. To the members of the W3 Baptist Church, we thank you so much for your faithfulness and your tithes and offerings. We have our scopes, our prayers, our hopes, dreams, and faith on securing a permanent place for us to worship. And that is in part to your tithes and your offerings. And so we thank you for your faithfulness and for your stewardship. Listen, we are doing a lot of ministry here at the W3 Baptist Church. And so we thank God for uh, this place of worship. We thank God for the W3 Baptist Church. We thank God for our vision team and all of our members uh, who are faithful and are supporters of the W3 uh, Baptist Church. Amen. Prayerfully, you've had an opportunity to give. The good thing about electronic payments is check this out. You can whip out your cell phone. You can go on your computer, your smart device. You can wake up at 3 in the morning and send W3 a tithe in the offering. Amen. Uh, so whatever the spirit hits you, sometimes it just hits you and say, give. Just wake up. Don't, don't you sleep in. You wake up. And you're going to give what God has placed on your heart to give. God ain't going to let you sleep. He's going to. Get up, get up, get up, give that tithe, amen. So you can go ahead and give that electronically, and we thank and praise God for you. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for the tithe. We thank you for the offering. We especially thank you for the sower and sowers of the seeds. We pray, oh God, that you would bless the sowers, that you would be faithful to your promise and return to them some 60, 90, and 100 fold. And God, we don't give to get in return, we give because you have commanded us to give. We give out of faithfulness to your word. We give out of obedience to your word. And then, God, we stand on your promises. And you promised that you would open the window of heaven and pour us out blessings that we don't have room enough to receive. So, God, we thank you. We thank you for the ability to give. We thank you for the employment. We thank you for the jobs. We thank you for the streams of income that you have allowed to flow into our lives because we can only give because you first gave to us. So God, we thank you for every sower. We thank you for all the seeds, the tithes, the offerings, the sacrificial offerings that have been given on this day and to come. And we lift it all up to you and we bless you for it, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Listen. Oh my gosh, we've had such a wonderful time in the Word of God. I don't know about you, amen, but I feel like the children of Israel. I have worshipped in my chapter 15. I'm ready to go eat in my chapter 16, amen. And I hope and pray that you all are enjoying your families, your friends, and your loved ones. I pray that you are being safe as we are enjoying this was good weather. It looks a little cloudy and uh, some rain drizzle outside, but I pray that you continue to be safe and always let uh, the light of our Father shine in our lives. Let your light so shine that others may see your good works and give God the glory. Always remember to pray for each other. Would you please lift your pastor up in prayer and would you also remember to pray for the W3 Baptist Church. We love you. Ain't nothing you can do about it. We'll see you next time. Oh, wait a minute. We have announcements. I'm telling y'all about it. Hold on for one second. Uh, let's hear our announcements. Greetings, W3 Church. These are your announcements for the week of March 26th. On this last Sunday of Women's History Month, we congratulate Sister Sonia Rogers for being recognized by her colleagues at the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers for being the first African-American female chief of small business program. We salute you, as well as all of the women of the W3 Church for all of the amazing things that you do. 
get ready to pop into our Double Good Popcorn Sale. Treat yourself while supporting the W3 Baptist Church. Be on the lookout for a link posted in our Facebook page and in our Remind group. Then enter the code L, P as in Paul, N as in Nancy, B as in Boy, W, W. Again, the code is L, P, N, B, W, W. We thank you in advance for your support. Join our church ministry team. We are looking forward to working with you. There are plenty of ministries to match your interests and skills, including our newly added care and comfort ministry, along with congregational care, hospitality, media, music, seniors, Sunday school, trustees, ushers, and youth. Feel free to speak with any ministry member after each service. The W3 Online Church is open. You may purchase items by scanning the QR code on your screen or by visiting our website at www.thew3church.com. Items are also available for purchase immediately following church services. This concludes our announcements for the week. As always, thank you for joining us at the W3 Church, where we preach what the Bible says. Amen. Amen. We hope that you uh, adhere to our announcements. And again, we're so grateful for our media ministry. Uh, we honored uh, Sister Sonny Rogers at our 730 AM service. Also, Sister Marguerite Smith celebrating her 75th uh, birthday today. Amen. And so we honor her as well. And so we thank God for, for all of you that are here and those of you that are tuned in uh, through our social media sites. God bless you. Amen. All right. Let's whisper a word of prayer and we will go on uh, to all of our uh, weekly festivities and responsibilities. God, we thank you. Uh, for this worship experience on today. We pray uh, that the word of God will be sealed in our hearts. We pray, O oh God, that we are the wiser, the stronger, and the better after being in your presence. We pray that you would keep us, that you would hold us, that you would secure us, that you would help us, that you would save us. And God, we know uh, that there is no problem too big for you. So we turn it all over. We put it all in your hands. We're trusting and believing in you. We pray for our brothers and sisters to our left and right and front and behind us, those that are at distance. We lift them up to you. We pray for the W3 Baptist Church. We pray for all churches open up in your name, preaching the word of the Lord. And now, God, as we leave from this place, we pray for your traveling graces as we go about our weekly activities for the upcoming week that you would keep us, that you would secure us, that you would hold us until we meet again. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 amen.